But praise God, it's important to, to honor the blood of Jesus and honor uh, his redemptive work and what, what that means to us. The reason we're even here to celebrate, enjoy life, and uh, be able to have fellowship with God is because Jesus shed his blood. So we always, it's always important to point back to some of the blessings of our redemption and what, what Jesus' sacrifice means to us today. So look in your Bibles this morning to Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10. Praise the Lord. Let's begin reading at verse 6 here for a few verses. It says, But the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise. Well, righteousness speaks. Faith speaks. So the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise. Say not in thine heart who shall ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down from above, or who shall descend into the deep, that is to bring up Christ again from the dead. But what says it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart, that is the word of faith which we preach. Verse 9, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Praise the Lord. Let me just kind of briefly just bring a meaning out of what, what he was saying here for our purposes this morning. He said, of course, don't say this, you know, we're not to be saying, faith doesn't say this, let's go get Jesus out of heaven. Faith doesn't say that. Faith doesn't say, you know, because some people will say, oh, if Jesus were just here today, man, I could get the victory. I could get my prayer answered. If Jesus were just here, he could do something about this. And he goes on to say, don't, don't say that let's descend, let's descend down into the deep. In other words, you remember Jesus, he went into the heart of the earth three days and nights after his crucifixion. Well, what he was doing, he was still accomplishing our victory over the devil. He was still uh, involved in his redemptive work of spoiling principalities and powers. They're in the heart of the earth. And so what is, what is he saying here? Don't, don't, let's don't say, let's, let's bring Jesus out of heaven where he's seated at the Father's right hand now. Uh, and let's don't say, let's pull Jesus up out of the earth because that's the only way we're going to get our victory. Because if you're pulling him up out of the heart of the earth out of those three days and night, that means he hasn't fully defeated the devil yet. But did you know Jesus already defeated the devil? And he was raised up victorious over the devil. And he's seated right now at the Father's right hand, right hand as victor over Satan and all of his power. So he, Paul's saying, this is not how you're going to get victory in life. This is not how you're going to get born again. This is not how you're going to pass from death to life. This is not how you're going to be able to get your answer today is by trying to get Jesus back here on the earth. He's saying, this is how you're going to get your victory. It's in your heart. It's in your mouth. It's the word of faith coming out of your mouth. In other words, he's saying your answer is under your nose. <laughs> your answer is really, in one sense, under your nose. He's letting you know the authority is in your mouth. Yeah, and what you believe in your heart, but also in your mouth. Praise God, because he said, if you believe in your heart, confess you with your mouth. That's how you get saved. In other words, that's how you get every blessing of salvation. Glory be to God. So, so we don't need to be saying that we need Jesus to come bring us the victory. God's letting us know here through the Apostle Paul that you have something to do with your victory because Jesus has already won it for you. Amen. Now, you have a responsibility to do something about your victory in life, about receiving what Jesus purchased for you by his precious blood. Receiving salvation, receiving answers to prayer, receiving healing in your body, receiving your need met. That has to do more with you now than God. You and I, we have authority. He's given us authority to believe in our heart, to confess with our mouth. Glory to God. So you can say, that's why I said the victory is right under your nose. Don't look into heaven. Don't look into the heart of the earth. Look right under your nose. 
your mouth. There's authority in your mouth. Authority to overcome. Authority to enforce the victory of Christ. There's your answer. What you believe and say. That's in a nutshell what he's really saying there. Praise God. See, if you'll learn to say the right things, that's going to bring you what you need. That's going to, that's going to cause you to enforce the victory that Jesus already won for you when he went to the cross and shed his blood. What does Revelation 12, 11 say? They overcame him by the blood of the lamb. But how many know it didn't stop there? But also by the word of their testimony. Amen. That reveals to us right there that, yeah, God did his part. But how many know if we're going to have victory, we got to do our part. The authority is in your mouth to overcome in this life. Praise God. Praise God. You know, I'll be, I'll be studying and going, thinking I'm going to go a certain direction, you know, and then the Lord seems to bring me back sometime to the authority and, and the words of our mouth at different times. But uh, how many of God, we need in these last days believers who learn to walk in their authority. Part of this last day move of God is going to take believers who know how to live by faith and use their faith for themselves, yes, but also for others. Hallelujah. So when, when, the, when the Lord brings, see, I could, as far as I'm concerned, I could teach on this. I could teach on the authority of the believer and the words coming out, how important the words are. Your, I could teach on that every week till I, till I go to heaven, and that wouldn't bother me a bit. I would feel like I've done what I'm supposed to do. In other words, it's that important and it's that real to me. It's that fresh to me. It's that alive to me. So it ought to be something fresh and alive every time we start, start talking about these things. Because it, it's going to come out a different way every time. But yet it's still going to reinforce some of the same truths. God, God wants us. This is an important message that the church has to hear and, and get a hold of. For at least the ones that are going to walk in victory in the last days. Glory to God. <laughs> so Jesus doesn't have to come back and fix your situation because he's already fixed it. Amen. But now you and I are to enforce that victory in our life. We have a part to play. There's authority in your mouth to enforce the victory of Christ. See, Jesus gave us that authority when he was raised from the dead. And when he was seated at the, at, at the Father's right hand, the Bible says you were raised together and seated together with him. He's, he's given you the same authority. You're seated with him in heavenly places. You're a joint heir with Jesus now. The Bible says so. But now we have that, again, we have that responsibility to walk this out. That's why we're not supposed to live out of our intellect. We're not supposed to live out of the works and the, and the ability of the flesh. We're to be living uh, and, 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 and enforcing our, the victory we have in Christ. We need to be doing that from our seated position in Christ. Because your spirit man, the real you, is seated with Jesus as far as a position. That's our position. It's a position of victory. It's a position of authority. We are not just mere men. Paul, Paul said that in 1 Corinthians 3. He said, you're not just mere men. In other words, we're not just, just like every man on the earth. We're born of the Spirit of God. We've been changed. Now we're, we're, we're now in Christ. We're in a seated position with him, ruling and reigning with him as joint heirs with Jesus. And the word of God in your heart and the word of God coming out of your mouth will do the same thing for your life that it did for Jesus' life. Some folks, that's kind of overwhelming thought, but it's the same word and we have the same spirit of faith. And he's the one that gave us his authority. He's the one that said, now I've got the keys of hell and death. I've defeated the devil. But then he turns to us and says, now you go. You, you've been now been given the keys of the kingdom. You go. You use your authority. He said, I've given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. That's authority. That's dominion 
over sin, over disease, over anything that will try to steal, kill, and destroy in your life. Over the curse. Glory to God. It's ours. So I tell you, this, ought to, just this reality, and you get this on the inside of you, it'll make a fighter out of you. You may not be much of a fighter now, but you, say, you hang around this long enough, you'll become one. See, I may not have won every battle, I may not, I, but, but bless God, I'm going to fight. I've got some fight in me. I've been knocked down before, but I get back up, I say, I'm going to win that one next time. None of us have arrived, none of us, I mean, uh, uh, and, and that's true with preachers. I, have you know, I'm not graced to live it any more than anybody else is. No preacher is. We have to live it the same way everybody else has to live it. We get to, but the thing is, we get to live this. We get to exercise these principles. Praise God. But sometimes there is a fight. Sometimes we do fall, maybe fall short of what we were expecting. Maybe, maybe our faith wasn't where we thought it was. But praise God, we have an opportunity now if we understand this and realize this is God's will for my life to walk in authority, to walk in victory, and that there's authority in my mouth and I can change situations and circumstances, then that ought to put a fight in every one of us to say, it doesn't matter what's gone before, my future's bright and I'm walking in victory, and I'm going to fight till this thing lines up with the Word of God in my life. I'll, I'll do what I have to do. I keep believing. I keep saying. I'm going to keep saying till the situation changes. Praise God. So there's authority in your mouth. You know, the, Jesus, again, he said, I've given you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. What, what is he saying? He's talking about, he lets us know one thing. This is how heaven operates. How? With the authority of words. If things get out of order, this is how you straighten them up. Remember there was a time in heaven, a, a being called Lucifer. Later known as the devil. But in heaven he was Lucifer. He had a wonderful position in heaven, but sin was found in him. He, was, he got into pride. And he said, I'm going to exalt my throne above the throne of God. And he was able to persuade a third of the angels to join his cause. But how did God straighten up the disorder in heaven with his word? He cast him down. He said, no, you're, you're, going, you're heading to the earth. And of course, God's power always backs his word. And enforces that, just like it will enforce the word of God in your life. But that's how God got things back into order in heaven. That's why Jesus said, these are, these, you can give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. This is how heaven even operates. Uh, heaven brings order with words. God speaking his word. God speaking forth things. Well, thank God we have the, the word of God in our mouth now. That's how we're supposed to enforce our authority. That's when things get out of order in our life. The devil's doing some stealing, killing, and destroying in our life. How are we going to get the things back into order, into God's order? By believing in our heart and speaking the word out of our mouth. And you don't have to try to get Jesus to come out of heaven. You don't have to try to get him up out of the, from, the, from the heart of the earth, you know, descend or, or ascend. Uh, you don't have to get him here. He's already whipped the devil. Now it's your turn to open your mouth. Speak the word of God. Hallelujah. Well, this is true whether you shout or not. <laughs> Romans chapter 5, verse 17. Romans 5, 17. For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. Now, several translations say reign as kings. Reign as kings. Would well, you know you're, the reign as, you're supposed to reign as a king in this life? The Bible says you're kings and priests unto God. Scripture also reveals Jesus is the king of kings. Uh, so you're a king. That means you're to be reigning in your realm under his lordship. It doesn't mean you can reign in everybody else's realm. You can't, you can't use your dominion and authority for everybody else, but you can use it in, in your realm of authority. You can change situations that come up against you. 
See, that's how a king rules. He makes decrees. He speaks things. Amen. Well, we need to be dominion-minded. When something gets out of line, just like a king does, he says, he'll get a servant, he'll say, you go do something about this. I want it, I want it this way, I want it that way. Well, that's, we take the word of God, get it in our heart, get it in our, coming out of our mouths, and that's how we begin to exercise authority in our lives over the things that don't line up with God's word in our life. So don't just lie down and let the devil steamroll you. No Christian should be that way. Too many Christians don't know the truth, though, so they allow the enemy just to run over them in life. You know, mountains, Jesus said, you're supposed to do something about that mountain. So many Christians got mountain ranges all around them. <laughs> Things that the enemy has brought into their life. Jesus said, you, you know, you need to do something about that. That's what a king would do. A king makes a decree and gets things moved. But too many, too many Christians are, are really abdicating their authority. Abdicating or relinquishing their position as a king. <laughs> so you, you've, got, you've been given authority to change situations. Remember Jesus? He, you know, how many of Jesus spoke to things? He spoke to a fig tree, remember, in Mark 11. He spoke to a fig tree. He said, You're not, no fruit will gonna come from you anymore. He cursed that, he cursed that fig tree, and, and the next day the disciples walked by, and that fig tree was dead from the roots. All because Jesus spoke to it. See, if you hang around Jesus, if you were hanging around Jesus during that time, you'd start speaking to some things too. I'm amazed how people criticize this message of confession and speaking the word out of your mouth. I, I don't understand that because if you hang around Jesus, you'd be starting to speak to things. Jesus spoke to a fever. Jesus spoke to wind and waves, and they ceased. What was he doing? He was exercising authority with the words of his mouth. He spoke to Lazarus. He spoke to a dead man. He said, come forth. He spoke. He used his authority with the words of his mouth. That's how he exercised it. Now, when Jesus did that in Mark 11 and spoke to that fig tree, and that fig tree was, died from the roots, he didn't turn around to the disciples and say, now, now, guys, I was a little hungry and got a little upset there. And so I spoke to that tree, and that's just something us members of the deity club do. You know, we have a special club, me, God, Holy Ghost, and we even allow Michael and Gabriel to come in. We have this special club, and we can speak to things, and things happen, but you peons, I'm sorry, you're just mere men, forget about it, don't try this at home. <laughs> no, Jesus didn't do that. In fact, when the disciples said, look at the tree, Jesus said, look at the mountain. He didn't say, no, guys, sorry. No, he said, look at the mountain. Guys, I did that to the tree, but then he used one of the most wonderful words in the world, whosoever. Mark eleven twenty three, Mark eleven twenty three. That one word gathered in every one of us. Woo, whosoever. I used to sing as a, as a little Baptist boy in church. Whosoever surely meaneth me. Talking about John 3, 16. God so loved the Lord, he gave his only begotten son. Whosoever should believe on him. Well, if it's true for, Mark, if it's true for John 3, 16, then whosoever is also true for Mark eleven twenty three. 23. Amen. Came out of the same mouth of the same individual. Whosoever, whosoever shall say, wow. And they're, all of a sudden they're going, that mountain? Whosoever shall say in this mountain, be thou removed, be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass. He shall have whatsoever he saith. 
In other words, a whosoever can see mountains moved out of their way. And he wasn't talking about a literal mountain really for us. He, it, really, it was an illustration of the mountains, obstacles, adversity that come into your life. In other words, if you're going to see things change, it's not going to be because God goes whoosh and just sovereignly moves that out of the way. If you're going to see things change, it's because you open your mouth where, where your authority is. And you speak to that mountain. You speak to that giant. You speak to that adversity. In other words, you act like a king and make decrees in your realm of influence. Praise God. Praise God. See, remember that, remember that uh, centurion in Matthew 8? He got a hold of this principle and it kind of blew Jesus away. Like, whoa, hadn't, hadn't found any faith like this in all of Israel. Because he wanted his servant healed, and Jesus said, I'll come to your house. And the, and, the, and the centurion says, you don't have to come to my house. All you got to do is open your mouth. All you have to do is say something, and, and, and what you say, that's, that's good enough for me. As far as I'm concerned, it's done. Just speak the word only. He understood that. He understood the authority that comes with words. He understood that Jesus had that authority and all he had to do was say something and the sickness, the disease was defeated. Hallelujah. Amen. And of course, as I said, Jesus, he marveled at that because the centurion goes on and says, you know, I'm a military man. I understand that when I say go, to one of the guys under me because he was the head of a hundred soldiers. He said, if I say go, he goes. If I say come, he comes. He didn't say it. He didn't say if I think go, he goes. If I think come, he comes. He said, if I say it, something happens. Things move. Things change. He understood that authority is enforced with words of faith. Then we need to understand that, don't we? <laughs> if we're going to see some things change in our life, it's not going to be because we sit around and sing Kumbaya. It's not because we, 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 we get this idea, well, God is in control. God, if God wants it to happen, it's going to happen. You know what that's doing? That's abdicating your throne. It's relinquishing the throne in the spirit that God has seated you on. That place in the spirit, that realm where in Christ where you're seated with him in heavenly places. In the seat of authority, when you start saying, God, I guess God will take care of that, then right there, you're just abdicating your throne. Your kings can ab abdicate, abdicate thrones, right? They can relinquish their throne. Remember king, uh, the, in history, King Edward in the 1930s of England, he was the king of England, but he wanted to marry a woman that he wasn't supposed to marry. And then the rules were, the laws were, if you marry someone, I think she'd been divorced or whatever, if you marry her, you got you to give up your throne to do that. You got to relinquish the throne. Well, he did it. That's when King George came in, the guy they did the movie on the king's speech, you know. Uh, that's when he came into power because his brother stepped down. He relinquished his throne. Well, see, Christians do that. I said Christians do that all the time. They abdicate their position of authority where we're to be ruling and reigning. Amen. Because if you're asking God to do something about the devil when he's already told you to do something about it, then you're relinquishing your position. You're abdicating your throne. When you're asking God to do something about the devil, when he's already told you to do something about the devil. See, again, some people say, well, God is sovereign. Well, they misunderstand what God's sovereignty is. Yes, God is the most high God. There is no being higher in authority than him. But sovereignty has been taught wrong in the church world. Some teach that 
since God is sovereign, he'll just do anything he wants to, anytime for anybody, and, uh, you know, that he's just in total control of everything. He's running everything and everybody. But you know what God cannot do? He cannot violate his own word. God cannot violate his own word. Psalm 138 verse 2 says, he's exalted his word above his name. You know, if God all of a sudden, and he's not going to do this, but if he just all of a sudden had a whim and decided, you know, I really, I really don't want anybody else to go to hell, so I'm going to just absolve all the rules of that. I'm, not, I'm just going to forget the rules that I've set up. I'm going to forget my word. I'm just going, I'm going to let everybody in now. Everybody goes to heaven. They don't have to believe on my son. They don't have to receive Jesus, the sacrifice that was made for them. No, God can't do that. God can't violate his own word. See, God loves all men. That hadn't changed. But God still gives man a free will to choose him, choose life, or choose death. Amen. God's not going to violate his word. <laughs> He's not going to come down and say, well, you know, I know a lot of those folks don't want to be filled with the Holy Ghost, but I'm going to make them speak in tongues anyway. <laughs> a lot of those Christians, they don't want the Holy Ghost, but tough. They're going to wake up babbling in the morning. God's not going to do that. He's not going to violate his word. Why? Because the Holy Ghost is a gift, and the gift has to be received. You have to yield your heart, yield your spirit. You have to, by faith, receive. Same is true with every other gift. God doesn't force anything on anyone. Amen? Hallelujah. See, God has even obligated himself to what he said. God's word is the highest authority in the, in the universe. So you're not to be asking God to come down and do something about the devil when he's already told you to resist the devil and he'll flee. If he told you to resist the devil, guess what? He's not going to resist him for you. So if you let that fear just run rampant in your life, God's not going to stop it. He loves you. He wants it stopped. He's made a way for it to be stopped. Blood was shed so that you could be free. We sang about it earlier, didn't we? The chains are gone because of the blood. But we still have to enforce our victory. We've got to believe this word in our heart. We've got to believe what Jesus did for us on Calvary in our heart. Then we need to begin to speak it out of our mouth and exercise our authority with the words of our mouth. There's authority in your mouth. But you're going to have to use it and enforce it. You and I are going to have to use that authority, enforce that authority. Don't get down off the throne that Jesus has exalted you to sit on. Don't abdicate your authority and, and your position as a king in him. You know, it's kind of like, what would you think about a policeman? You know, we've got one of Montgomery's finest. I think we have, a, we have another as well, uh, She's not here today. We've got several Montgomery's finest in our church, officers, you know. But what would you think, and this wouldn't happen with one of our officers, but, but what would you think if a policeman, if he's walking by, walking by a bank and he sees somebody in there with a hood on his head and a gun and uh, waving that gun around, people hitting the floor, what would you think if that policeman grabs his cell phone and says, give me the governor's office? I need to speak to the governor right now. We've got, we've got some, I got to talk to the governor. And they put him through to the governor. And, he's, and, and the policeman says, Governor, there's some people robbing this bank right down here in Montgomery. I, what, what are we, what you going to do about it? We would think, well, that's kind of stupid. And the governor would say, hey, stupid. You're the one that raised your hand in that meeting and you swore to uphold the Constitution of the state and, all, and, and the laws and, there, and, and you've got the badge. You've got to get in there and get him. Shoot him, whatever. Oh. <laughs> Praise the Lord. 
But that's what a lot of Christians are doing. God! Hey, God! Look what the devil's doing. God! <laughs> and God's up there saying, I put... Jesus whipped the devil already. He ain't coming back. Amen. Get in my book. Get the word in your heart and in your mouth. Amen. And you do something about it. Now listen, there's a time to fellowship with God and talk to God and commune with God. But then there's a time to turn to the mountain and you speak to it. And God's not going to take that position of authority that he's given you. He's not going to go back on his word. not going to violate it. Amen. In fact, he's you know, just like that, that officer was sworn. How many of you have been sworn in? Everybody raise your right hand. Amen. You've already been sworn in. You're a child of God. This, you can just make this your swearing in ceremony. Amen. Jesus is saying, you've been authorized. I've given you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. What you bind on earth. In other words, what you say stop to is going to be stopped. What you loose, not what he looses, what you loose in earth, he'll, he'll be loosed in heaven. But who's the responsibility on there to do the binding and the loosing? Us first. God backs it. Oh, praise God. Praise God, he backs it up. Reminds me of a, of a story I just recently heard of the Rama, a Rama pastor shared this uh, heard this last week that, excuse me, that um, he, he has a, a lady in his church. She, she's not a big lady. She's a police, but she's a police officer in a Midwestern city. And uh, she goes to his church, though. She's been learning the word, learning about who she is in Christ and learning about her authority. And one night she was out uh, on, you know, in her car, in a police car, and she saw somebody break, a, a, you know, just a, a violation, a traffic violation, stopped, stopped this individual and end up being, uh, she stopped and found out, though, and checked his plates. And this is a real big guy, about 300-pound dude. She has him get out of the car, find out he's, this is a stolen car. He he'd had a rap sheet a mile long. He'd been a rapist and all kinds. Of, I mean, just a dangerous guy. Finds out she, she frisked him down a little bit. He had a, had a gun in his holster. Ends up he had some other guns hidden on him, too. But, but he kept looking. He, was, he would see her, but he kept looking over her shoulder, too. And, uh, and, and she finally, uh, and she'd already called for some police backup, but nobody, but, but, but she, she's the one who had to go in and get him, uh, you know, handcuffed and in the car. And uh, even though he had a history, they found out later, this guy had a history of just being extremely violent and would probably would have attacked under normal circumstances. But before he put her, she put him, a little five, seven gal puts him into the back seat of that car. He turned to her and said, boy, your partner doesn't say much, does he? Comes to, come to find out, you know, a little later that uh, this guy said, talked about, there was a, you know, there was a, a big, big old officer standing right behind her the whole time. And he just thought that was her silent partner, you know, just a quiet partner. And the, the guy behind, he said, the police, he was dressed like a policeman, looked like a police, said he was bigger than the guys that she put in the car. So that held him back. Now, she wasn't just walking in her authority as an officer. She was walking in her authority in Christ. And I want you to know you have backup. Amen. All of heaven backs your authority. Hallelujah. That blood that was shed represents all of heaven backing your authority when you speak the word in faith. When you take your stand on God's word. Hallelujah. Amen. Well, Pastor, I tried it, and it, and it just didn't work. Well, this doesn't work by trying it. This reminds me of Gomer Powell. You know, Barney, you know, Barney deputized Gomer. Now, you parents do show your kids some of these old Andy Griffiths so, so you can understand some of my messages. <laughs> Barney deputized Gomer. And Gomer one time, you know, he didn't even, he, he had to go running and, 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 and you know, and enforce some, enforce the law. With, and, but he's acting like, you know, where's the police? <laughs> he's, you know, just had a badge hanging off of him, but he, he's going, Shazam. 
Notice he didn't know he had the authority. See, you got to get this on the inside of you. A lot of Christians are like that. Shazam! I'm supposed to use my authority? The devil's doing this? I'm supposed to do what? I'm supposed to speak the word? Yeah, you got to get that word down on the inside of you. And, and there, there was one time at Barney, though, he finally, you know, he tipped his cap forward. Whenever he tipped his cap forward, you know, and got tucked down real tight, man, you know, that's when you start singing the song, bad boy, bad boy, what you going to do? Because <laughs> he was acting bad, you know, he could act real tough. But he was, but even Barney, little old Barney, he still knew his badge carried weight, that he had authority. <laughs> Sometimes. Sometimes Barney was scared, you know, but praise the Lord. See, we may even be that way spiritually. Sometimes we may feel like we may feel weak, but we've got to remember you've been authorized. You've been sworn in. You put your hand up, didn't you? You've been sworn in. You're authorized. Jesus said, I've given you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. What you bind on earth is bound in heaven. What you loose on earth is loosed in heaven. Jesus said, I've given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. But guess what? We have to enforce that authority. There's authority in your mouth. What are you doing with that? Are you talking the problem? Are you, just, uh, are you abdicating your position? Are you just talking about how big and bad the devil is? Are you trying to give it all over to God and say, God, you do, you do something about this? Or are you using your authority in Christ? Are you speaking the word of God? Are you speaking to that mountain in faith and expecting it to move? See, that's why you got to get in the word. You got to get this word down on the inside of you. You got to meditate in these truths so that it becomes a reality on the inside of you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. See, some things shouldn't be talked to God about. They need to be talked to the mountain. You got to speak to that mountain eventually. But thank God you got back up, the power of God. <laughs> Hallelujah. A couple more verses real quick. Look at Exodus chapter 14. I want, us, I want you to see a type or a picture here. Praise God. Say, I've been authorized. I've been authorized. I, have I have authority over all the power of the enemy. Of the enemy. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It's good to just say those things. Just, I mean, I, I, I'll just, I'll do that sometimes, especially if I know, if I feel like the Lord wants me to pray for someone, or I'm going to be praying for someone, or I'm just, or even in a service, if I feel like I'm going to be laying hands on people, or what, for, for healing, or whatever, I'll just, uh, but, you know, walk around some in the morning, I say, I have authority. I just reinforce that in my own heart, I speak that. I have authority over disease. I have authority over the devil. Amen. And I just reinforce that in my own heart. I meditate in those things and speak those things. Well, we need to be doing that on a regular basis. Every one of us, because every one of us has authority in our realm to use that authority over sin, sickness, disease, and all the power of the enemy. Here in Exodus chapter 14, Mo uh, Moses and Israel about you know, facing with, you know, with the army of Egypt, Pharaoh right behind them, and they're about to, uh, you know, up, up to the edge of the Red Sea. And the people were complaining and, and saying, oh, we're just going to die out here, you know. And, and, uh, and, and Moses turns to God. And, and, uh, but look, notice what God says in verse 15. The Lord said to Moses, wherefore criest thou to me? Isn't that interesting? Well, you're the one that led us out here. What are you going to do about it? Well, notice what God, notice, notice here. Speak unto the children of Israel that they go forward, but, verse 16, lift thou up thy rod. In other words, Moses, you have a part in enforcing this victory. Yes, it was God's power that parted that sea. But God didn't part the sea till Rose, Moses lifted up the rod. That rod is a type. It's a symbol of the words coming out of your mouth. It's a symbol of our authority. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Lift up thy rod, stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it, and the children of Israel shall go on dry ground to the midst of the sea. Well, that's what happened. He lifted up his rod. It represented authority. 
and the Red Sea was split because Moses cooperated with God and did his part. How many know we got to do our part? We can't put that off on God. We can't abdicate the throne of authority in our life. They're in chapter 17. Chapter 17 of Exodus. They, they, here they were in the desert. How many know water is valuable in the desert? Here in chapter 17, verse 6, <clears throat> well, verse, verse 5 first. And the Lord spoke unto Moses, Go on before the people and take with thee the elders of Israel and thy, and thy rod, wherewith thou smotest the river. Take in your hand and go. Verse 6. Behold, I will stand before thee there upon the rock in Horeb, and thou shalt smite the rock, and there shall come out water, there shall come water out of it that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. Now, why didn't God just send an angel down and the angel kick the rock and water gush up out of it? Well, see, God's given us a picture. He's given us a type. How I many you know? Paul said we, we need to look at the children of Israel because they're examples or in samples or types for us. Well, why, why, God was giving us a picture here of the fact that we need to use our authority. We need to use the authority he's given us. It's the authority of God. It's the authority of Christ. But Jesus is the one that said, I've given you the keys. But we're the ones that have to use the keys, right? We're the ones that have to open our mouth. There's authority in your mouth. But you're going to have to speak. You're going to have to use that authority. Hallelujah. God's not going to, God's, in other words, what's God's letting him know here? I'm not going to do this for you. You're going to have to cooperate. You're going to have to lift up the rod. I'm not going to do it. If you want the water, lift up the rod. You want the answer? Now, one thing water represents is a supply. It represents a supply, doesn't it? Water is a valuable supply. Listen, you have, God has a supply for you. A supply of blessing, a supply of healing, a supply of financial provision for your life. But how many of there are times you need to lift up your rod? If that supply is going to come pouring forth, you're going to have to lift up your rod. You can't sit back and say, oh, why is this happening to me? Why isn't God doing something? Why, 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 why? Lift up your rod. Open your mouth. Oh, glory to God. Oh, glory. This is so important. This is important. <laughs> People wonder, why isn't that mountain moving? Why, didn't think, why aren't things changing? It's because the rod's sitting beside you. You've abdicated your throne. You're not using your authority in Christ. Then he goes on uh, in, in this chapter as well, verse, verse 8. And then came Amalek and fought with Israel in Rephidim. And Moses said unto Joshua, Choose us out men that go, and go out and fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I'll stand on the top of the hill with the rod of God in my hand. Verse 10, So Joshua did as Moses said to him and fought with Amalek. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur and, uh, went up to the top of the hill. And it came to pass, when, verse 11, when Moses held up his hand. In other words, he held up the rod that rod in his hand, that Israel prevailed. And when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. When he abdicated his authority, his position, as the one who's supposed to hold the rod, they, they begin to lose. That's why you've got to keep the word coming out of your mouth no matter what it looks like or what it feels like. Did you hear me? you got to keep that word coming out of your mouth of what you desire, what you need. Hallelujah. What you're speaking to that problem. You keep the word coming out of your mouth. Don't change, your, don't change what you're saying to line up with what you feel and what it looks like. Keep speaking the word of God out of your mouth. The situation has to turn around. Why? Because you've got, you got backup. you got all of heaven backing you up, all of heaven backing that word up. As long as you keep God's word in your heart and in your mouth, hallelujah, no devil can stop you from getting your supply. No devil can keep you from winning in the battles of life. But if you lay it down, I'm not going to do that. If you start letting your mouth just 
run in line with what you feel and what it looks like, then you open the door to the enemy. Thank God, though. Listen, if you've missed it, we've all missed it. Thank God for the blood. You can get back up. If you've laid down your rod, you can, you can pick it back up. Hallelujah. I've had to do it. I've had to ask, Father, forgive me. I've started talking like a dummy. <laughs> I, I, I dropped my rod. I've been there. Dropped my rod. But, Father, I thank you for giving me. By the blood of Jesus, I receive my forgiveness, and I pick it back up. And I'm going to start speaking that again, speaking the word of God. Sometimes you've got to speak it till it gets down on the inside of you. Then it'll come out in power. Amen. It'll come out in strength out of your mouth. Sometimes you just got to stay with it, stay with it, stay with it. Keep the rod lifted. Keep smiting the rock. <laughs> Hallelujah. Till water comes out. <laughs> Praise God. As long as you know it's the will of God, as long as you know you're in line with God's word, keep smiting it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Aren't you glad there's authority in your mouth? Some of you are going to look at that mountain different to, after today. You just need to be reminded this morning that you have authority. So maybe you need to look at that mountain different. Stop walking around it and talking to other people about it. Some folks get on the phone, they talk about their mountain. Why are you talking about it when you should be speaking to it? We've all been there, but Amen. pick your rod back up. Get that word back in your heart and mouth. Start speaking the word. Amen? Amen? There's authority in your mouth. Begin to act like the word of God so. Praise God forever.